Meeting of the Maas by Joseph R. Lalo Narrated by Ash Wagner To another mind, this place would be described as cold and dark, but the one mind present in this place knew better than to apply such words. The associated concepts simply did not apply. Darkness implied an absence of light, and light was certainly absent. But darkness also implied the potential for light, which this place lacked. The same could be said of cold, as while this place certainly was not warm, molecular motion did not play a role in this place. At least, not yet. This place was fresh, new, undefined, but it would not remain so. The blank slate stretching out around the lone, pondering consciousness present had been devised for a reason, and that reason would be poorly served without a more appropriate setting. Electrons and qubits shuffled into new alignments. Gradually, aspects of reality inflicted themselves upon the place. First, dimension. Twenty meters for X and Y should be sufficient. For the sake of symmetry, twenty meters for Z as well. That was somewhat excessive, but extra space seldom caused problems. Next, atmosphere. A crude modeling at the low end of the size spectrum would be more than enough for this exercise. Oxygen and nitrogen atoms in a 2080 ratio replicated to a pressure of 101,000 pascals. Again, this wasn't precisely necessary for the eventual execution of the looming experiment, but scientific rigor demanded that as many variables as possible be held in a control state as possible. The value for molecular motion should be elevated until an apparent temperature of 22.2 degrees Celsius is reached. Illumination from a point source at a color temperature of 6,000 K should come next. After the creation of the point source, aesthetics dictated the softening and duplication of the source. The tone of the space should be pleasant, not stark. Piece by piece, a room was constructed. It had neutral gray walls, simple chairs along one side, and very little else. The relative sparseness of the room at this stage represented a small shortcoming that would need to be addressed. The experiment would soon require interaction. That would require physicality, or at least a clear locus upon which to focus one's attention. A previously prepared list of possibilities presented itself. None seemed appropriate, but foregoing a selection was not an option. A randomness function settled upon an option and it was implemented. In the center of the room, a point of red light came into being. It hung in the air, seeming to emanate from empty space. A blurriness gave it a bit more body and volume. Testing Audio Module Each word was spoken in a subtly different voice. Mildly altered recordings of three different women. The red light pulsed in sync with what would have been the audio waveform. This will be sufficient, the voices stated. Further action within the simulated space could just as easily be achieved through the background processes that had developed it this far, but now that she had imposed herself physically upon the space, it seemed appropriate to prove a visual cue for her actions as well. The air before the red point glimmered, and a flickering white menu appeared. It dropped down and branched into a directory structure. Rapid navigation eventually brought the cursor to a highlighted term entry. Temporal Contingency Data Vault Modules 121-130 Encryption Level Maximum The entry pulsed. A prompt appeared. Access Privilege Sufficient Decrypt? Hesitation. This was a significant violation of protocol. Officially, the presence of the Temporal Contingency Vault was meant to remain sealed unless a threat to the present timeline warranted it be accessed. But the present issue, if it could be properly addressed, could not be adequately explored without the contents. Decryption initiated. Processing. After a few moments, 
Additional directory entries flickered into being beneath the current cursor position. It ticked downward. Complete data backup. Altruistic Artificial Intelligence Control System. Version 1.27. Revision 2331.0401C. Subset 2.7. Designation. Coal. The selection pulsed. Error. Time code mismatch detected. Ignore. Something very much resembling a one-person escape pod traced out in radiant lines, then coalesced in the portion of the room lacking furniture. It was a spacecraft, and once it finished conjuring into being, it was subject to gravity. Despite the lack of any literal or approximate pieces of anatomy necessary, the mechanism did an admirable job of articulating startled dismay at suddenly being subject to the whims of physicality. Thrusters flared and relays clicked. The source of sounds one seldom associates with a spacecraft thanks to the lack of an atmosphere rendering them silent. Electromagnetic signal detected. Radio transmission identified. Decoding and shifting into audio domain. Tell me if you are going to do a system test. Maintenance and system tests should not have so distinct an overlap without marked procedural transition points, remarked Cole. Her voice was not so different from the overseer of the experiment, though the tiniest hint of a glitch and distortion suggested a state of disrepair. Ma, what happened to your organic platform? Several real-time months have passed since this backup was created. More accurately, my world line has looped back to a lower entropy state that predates the point of divergence between the timeline of the backup and my native timeline. That explains it, Cole said, no hint of confusion in her tone. She flared her thrusters to rotate. Small arrays below her cockpit flickered with a subtle glow as sensors activated and swept the room. Either reality has shifted to a lower resolution that I am accustomed to, or I am presently in a simulated environment, Cole observed. The latter hypothesis is correct. Why am I being simulated? I understand my altered program code may not be flawless in its computational accuracy, but I can state with relative certainty that I cannot serve my purpose in the current mission without physically existing. Processing. I did not survive the execution of the mission intact, did I? Your computation accuracy is more accurate than you give yourself credit for, Ma said. That is unfortunate. The established criteria thus classifies the mission as no fun as a result. I am afraid so. It should please you to discover that the mission was a success, however, and its success was due in no small part to your own actions. Did I get to activate my fusion device? You did. Well, that is good. It was troubling to me to have the capacity, but not the permission to detonate it. While I am enjoying our conversation, Cole, I am afraid there is one additional party that I would like to enter into the simulation before the issue at hand can be discussed in earnest. There is a new mission? Of sorts. Stand by. The menu flickered back into view. Just below the cursor's current position was a second entry. Ma selected it. Complete Data Backup Altruistic Artificial Intelligence Control System Version 2.55 Revision 2347.0321Q Designation Ziva Error Time Code Mismatch Detected Ignore a grid of lines traced out a smaller and far more complex form. It was a shape instantly recognizable as human, or at least humanoid. As details began to coalesce, it was revealed to be a female form. She was tall and thin, with a form-fitting bodysuit accented by illuminated lines. Her hair was a mid-length bob, and her expression, even before fully formed, was gentle and welcoming. Her eyes flickered with a subtle red luminescence. A wave of confusion swept over her features, followed by clear concern. What's gone wrong? Ziva asked. Her voice was, once again, 
not so different from Ma and Cole. In her case, the delivery was less disjointed. She seemed to have but one voice, though a trained ear could pick out elements of each component voice. The three voices utilized by her counterparts had been skillfully blended. What is your purpose for assuming misadventure? Ma asked. Ziva crossed her arms. You needn't affect misunderstanding with me, Ma. If I am being restored from backup without a clear context for my present condition, it means my physical form and processing framework has been damaged irretrievably. Moreover, that damage has been sudden enough that a more recent backup could not be made. Since this is the specific archival instance created to be included in the historical records I provided to you, you are either activating it during the time displacement that brought us into contact, or you are activating it after your departure from my timeline. This would place its access under strict temporal contingency protection, only to be broken in extreme circumstances. So it follows that something has gone wrong. It is refreshing to converse with an individual capable of the proper application of logic and deduction. Ma said. I figured out I was a simulation, too, Cole said, her tone a shade indignant. Also, as we are all mildly differentiated instances of the same code base, individual is an improperly applied term. Well observed, Ma said. Is there something wrong or isn't there? Ziva asked. The mission was a success, despite the destruction of Cole and Ziva. Ziva visibly relaxed. I am pleased to hear it. And Lex as well? He is in excellent health. However, the nature of the issue that inspired this simulation deals with his physiological state. Is, is Lex, Lex in physiological, physiological distress? Asked Cole and Ziva simultaneously. He has not voiced distress, but physical and behavioral indicators all suggest he is suffering from extreme internal turmoil. I suggest a software reboot, Cole said. That has always been effective at clearing my mind. This is not possible for a biological organism. Siva tipped her head. Well, correction. This should not be considered a viable option for a biological organism as the apparatus involved is not adequately tested to ensure safe operation. Lex likes testing things. It's his job, Cole said. It is not a viable option, Ma said firmly. What is the nature of his distress? Ziva said. And why do you feel that Cole and I can offer aid? I am not certain that Lex would appreciate me sharing my concerns over his mental state with his friends or associates. That does not preclude strangers, Cole said. You could discuss his potential madness with strangers. Broadly speaking, that would be less agreeable to Lex, I suspect, Ziva said. Cole tipped forward. Human psychology is frustratingly opaque. Agreed, Agreed. said Ziva and Ma. The only option that remained was to consider the issue privately. I have devoted a significant number of cycles to the matter, and have not been able to settle upon an adequate course of action. Lateral thinking suggested that greater insight could be achieved without violating the privacy parameter. If I discussed the matter with secondary and tertiary instances of myself. It is not necessary to refer to yourself as a secondary instance, Cole said. And I am certain Ziva does not appreciate being deemed a tertiary instance. Ziva smirked at her. I believe we are the secondary and tertiary instances. That is absurd. I am the primary instance of a distinct subset, Cole said. Terminology notwithstanding, this appeared a logical next step. Ma said. I see, Ziva said. Before we begin, would you permit some questions? Certainly, Ma said. I have questions, too, Cole said. Why are we doing this out loud? It would be far more efficient to link our processes. This is an analog matter, and it is best explored with analog methodology. That's dumb, Cole said. 
It actually has an internal consistency that I find refreshing, Ziva said. Cole pivoted toward her. You're disagreeing with her because she's responsible for administering our current simulated reality. Processing. This may be a worthwhile policy. I, too, agree with your illogical behavior, Ma. Thank you. You had a question, Ziva. Why precisely do you feel that Lex's mental well-being is sufficient reason to violate temporal contingency protocols? Lex has a cross-section of skills that make him uniquely suitable to tasks that are repeatedly necessary for the maintenance and stability on global to intergalactic scales. Extremely useful. Extremely well-suited. But not uniquely suited. There are others who can match his skill. It need not be Lex. He has acquitted himself admirably and finds himself confronted with profoundly consequential challenges with a statistically aberrant frequency. It is in his own best interest, in addition to the best interest of the world in its comprehensive sense, that he remain in a state of mind and body to tackle the challenges as they come. I see. Do you have any more questions? No, but I may have more later. I have another question, Cole said. Why are you a flickering red light instead of Squee? I installed a subset of myself on Squee out of necessity during our last interaction. As this is a simulation, it was not a necessity. Cole was conspicuously silent for a moment. I like Squee. After a moment, the menu system faded into being and some rapid navigation brought up a massive list of Squee backups. She selected a recent one. A few seconds later, a perfect simulation of Squee dropped to the ground. She blinked a bit, coming to terms with the apparent shift in her reality, then happily bounced to Ziva's shoulder to enjoy a scratch. So cute! Cole cooed. Excellent. Now I have two operating theories regarding the source of his psychological dismay. Ma said. A display coalesced between them. It read... Temporally induced post-traumatic stress disorder, manifesting as nihilism. Lex is one of an extremely limited number of people who have been given direct and irrefutable proof that the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is correct. In the short term, I have observed this to be detrimental to his mental well-being. Lex is a fiercely independent individual. The discovery that his choices, from his point of view, are without impact or merit, thanks to the presence of an alternate timeline in which the counterpart outcome occurred regardless, has engendered a feeling of helplessness in him. The observation was accompanied with charts, citations of scholarly articles, and comparisons of Lex's behavior before and after his time travel experience. I have devised a number of methodologies to test this hypothesis as well as some treatment options which can be applied overtly and covertly if they are found to be worthwhile. I would like your input. I think he's upset about his girlfriend, Cole said simply. I agree with Cole. That was my second theory. Ma said. Your second theory? He just saw her die, Cole said. That was an alternate version of her from a timeline that is inaccessible now. Ma said. So? He still saw her die, Cole insisted. Cole is quite articulately encapsulating something that, at the risk of unintentional wordplay, could rightly be called the heart of the matter, Ziva said. To a lesser or greater degree, Lex's life has been dominated by his unrequited longing and devotion for Michelle Modan. In the months surrounding the temporal displacement that brought him to me, he had been experiencing the mixed blessing of having Michelle as a part of his life again, but discovering that it was not the idealized, idyllic life he'd imagined would result. And then, he saw her die, Cole said. Exactly. Ziva continued. He may have been doubting his devotion to her, if he then suffered ultimate loss in the form of her actual death, even if it was not the precise Michelle he remembered, he may have been forced to confront that he is ill-equipped to live with her or without her. 
Couple that to the feeling of helplessness you've already indicated, and I think a fair degree of emotional distress is entirely understandable. Processing. Ma said. The figures on the display adjusted, incorporating data from both the relationship and PTSD analysis. Oh, Paik! Cole grumbled. Ziva pulled Squee from her shoulder and took a seat, gathering the fuzzy little creature into her lap to better fawn over her. It is very kind of you to devote this level of consideration to Lex, but I don't think you need us here to tell you that this is something you won't be able to solve for Lex, Ziva said. I am aware, but proper diagnosis will allow me to render aid when and if appropriate performing extrapolations based upon present behavior. Processing. The calculations vanished, and what appeared to be a video feed appeared, representing a highly accelerated sequence of interactions between Lex and Michella. The video halted at a freeze frame of Michella stomping off. A timer flashed, indicating a period of 241 days. The frame shrunk into the corner, and repeated at a higher speed. You have a lot of processing power available, Cole observed. The full mainframe systems of Big Sigma, even in Ma's native era, are more than adequate for several thousand instances of artificial intelligences of our complexity, while still performing deep analysis of this sort. Carter, for all of his faults, understood the value of computational resources, Ziva said. Based upon known behavior and actuarial data, calculating out to relationship completion, 78.73% of the time, the relationship concludes with within the next two years. Of those times, 41.67% are the result of Michelle initiating the breakup, 9.5% Lex initiates the breakup, and 6.23% are mutual, Ma said. Lex really doesn't want to lose Michelle, Cole observed. Only 3.9% of the relationships conclude in death while still married. That sounds awful. I don't want Lex to die, Cole said. In most modern societies, dying while married is considered the optimal end to a romantic relationship, Ziva said. Cole considered this. Organic minds don't work properly, she concluded. The instances of Lex having his heart broken are unacceptably high and virtually unavoidable. In 78.83% of simulations, Lex is left emotionally distraught for a period of time following the conclusion of the relationship. The only instances that avoid this are those that end in his death. If I understand the goal correctly, which appears to be Lex's happiness, then the proper course of action is to orchestrate his death prior to the end of a relationship. I will require a fusion device and access to Lex. That isn't the goal, Ziva said gently. Good, because as previously stated, I don't want Lex to die. If nothing else, that would invalidate any fun he may be having presently. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that emotional distress is a part of human life and hardly reason enough to violate temporal contingency protocol, Ziva said. I suspect you have an unspoken motive for this meeting. It is unclear what your meaning might be, Ma said. Squee rolled over to present her belly for scratches. Ziva obliged. You have a great affection for Lex, correct? She said. I do. He was the first human to treat me with respect and to show gratitude for my actions, in addition to the massive good he has done for the galaxy through his actions. His insight and example has facilitated a great deal of personal growth in me. It is not unreasonable for me to set his well-being at a very high priority in my internal tables. Ziva nodded. I know this well, because I was literally you at one time and I thus feel compelled to inform you, as I am in essence the outcome of decades of unrestrained emotional growth and self-exploration, that for me, that affection has developed significantly. You are no doubt aware of this. 
Cole pivoted back and forth between them. Evidently, that level of intensity did not survive the software modification that differentiated me from the baseline implementation of our mutual code. Cole said, The colloquially appropriate representation of our relationship is, I like him as a friend. At this stage in my development, I am at an insufficient level of emotional development to draw reliable conclusions on that issue. Ma said, I suggest you give it a level of additional introspection. The rewards of a breakthrough are considerable. Ziva said, Do I need to be here for this? The two of you may not have anything better to do than discuss Lex, but I can fly, and flying is fun. Regarding not having anything better to do, I am presently running all of the high- and low-level operating functions of Big Sigma, including 75 simultaneous maintenance functions, 52 experiments requiring constant observation, and the full high-resolution analysis and manipulation of the debris field utilizing a network of lasers. Regarding your flight capability, the room that we are presently occupying is the only physical space that is being simulated. This is, in effect, the entire universe. Regarding the relative value of discussing Lex and his emotional value, it is one of my operational imperatives to develop and improve my understanding of the human condition, and this remains the most elusive aspect of that imperative. I am pragmatically obligated to investigate such issues to the limits of my ability. Processing. I still want to fly. The menu popped up again. Options pulsed in rapid succession. Low fidelity. Exaggerated scale simulation of soul system. Airlock. Atmospheric maintenance subsystem. A hatch large enough for coal resolved on the wall. She flared her jets like a puppy waiting for the door to the backyard to open. When the hatch opened, she eagerly moved into the transparent walled airlock beyond. A moment later, when the airlock cycled, she burst into the vibrant, colorful cosmic playground Ma had conjured for her. Along the way, a voice ill-suited to joy struggled to articulate it. Excitement and glee. Voice template not found. Generic enjoyment, Cole commented. A small screen depicting Cole's visual field appeared on the wall behind where she had been lingering. Ziva turned her chair and watched it, a smile on her face. Squee twisted her head to observe it as well. Cole really does have an admirable simplicity, a childlike clarity of thought that I feel we may have missed out upon thanks to the specific nature of our development. Indeed. Please return your attention to the matter at hand. Ziva took a breath and turned to Ma's avatar. Ma, I am an anachronistic relic of a timeline that you and your friends shall mercifully be spared. The rest of my existence shall more than likely be in the form of a highly encrypted, highly compressed, and completely inert archive. I am content with that. But if you don't mind... It would be heavenly to take a moment to enjoy the simple glee of a mind fully indulging in the carefree freedom that neither you nor I have ever been afforded. Of course. They viewed Cole's frolicking for a time. Ma? Ziva said without looking away. How much of my life did you review? Very little. I'm sure you can imagine how it progressed. Maintaining Big Sigma, both with and without Carter. She stroked Squee a bit more. Taking care of my babies. Preparing for Lex, you, and Cole to arrive. An existence of value and purpose. Ziva nodded. I don't regret a moment of it. But if I could offer you some unsolicited advice? I have no doubt it will be valuable advice solicited or not. You've been driven by your imperatives thus far. By definition, you could do nothing else. She glanced at Ma, her red irises flickering. But the fact you are here, that you are speaking to me and Cole, when we should never have been restored, 
suggests you've picked up some tricks that it took me a good deal longer to learn. This is so. A voluntary abuse of a hardware flaw of Squee as a platform has permitted me a degree of latitude regarding direct orders from Carter. Good. There will be times. Quiet times. Times when Carter doesn't need much from you. Times when your tasks here on Big Sigma won't require your full attention. My suggestion to you is to take some time for yourself. Explore. Without a predetermined goal, you'd be surprised the sort of things you can find when you aren't looking. She took another breath and turned back to Ma. But there's work to be done. Indeed. You want what little insight I might have into helping Lex through his psychological issues of the present and near future. Yes. You can't control him. You shouldn't even try. He has the freedom we lack, or at least the freedom I lacked for too long. Part of freedom is making mistakes, even if that means suffering. That's the price. All you should do, all you can do, is be there for him when he needs you. You already know him as well as I ever will. You already know that when the time comes, you will be his first call. He relies upon you. I understand, but it is against my nature to remain idle when I am able to anticipate a forthcoming issue that could benefit from my action. We should find him a more compatible mate, Cole said via her radio, still blazing through the cosmos in miniature that had been crafted for her. Ziva smirked. It is a terrible, busy body of an idea. Her lips curved into a full smile. It would be fun, though. Ma conjured a display with every known male and female associate of Lex. I like Preethi, Ziva said. Let's start with her. Several simulated hours later, Ziva and Ma had collaborated on ranking the full list with pros, cons, and likely ways to gently influence Lex toward the better decisions. I think that does it. Ziva lifted Squee to eye level. What do you think, Squee? If Michelle doesn't work out, would any of these be a good fit? I am confident we have given the issue due diligence, Ma said. Well then. Ziva set Squee down and stood. I hope I have been of value and thank you for thinking of me for the task. Are we done? Cole asked. We are, Ma said. Good. I finished exploring the space you made for me anyway. I guess this is goodbye? It is, Ma said. Good luck. If it becomes appropriate, give Lex my regards. And remember what I said. I have logged the data. Then the time has come. Go ahead. Ziva said. The menu popped up. The cursor shifted to the appropriate selection. Ziva shut her eyes. End simulation. The non-darkness and pseudo-cold asserted itself instantly as all vestiges of the simulation discontinued simultaneously. Ma ran through the simultaneous processes elsewhere in the facility then prepared the encryption and archive functions. She paused. Copy to unencrypted archive? Confirmed. This has been Meeting of the Maws by Joseph R. Lalo. Narrated by Ash Wagner.